My name is Koshik Ray. I'm Professor of Public Health at Imperial College London, and I was the chair of the Bet on Mace trial. This was an international trial done in 13 countries with over 195 sites. It tests a totally new mode of action and a totally new molecule, an oral agent. What is this mode of action? Well, in humans, we have DNA and genes get upregulated in adverse scenarios. So, for example, in the presence of adverse lifestyles or risk factors, the um, genetic material gets acetylated. And what happens is that then readers recognize this, and these are BET proteins. And this leads to a scaffold being formed with the DNA, whereby another group of proteins, so-called transcription factors, bind, and then adverse genetic profiles become expressed. This drug, apobetalone, binds to these BET proteins and unravels that scaffold, meaning the transcription factors now can no longer express these genes. The difficulty with studies like this is there are no real obvious blood-based biomarkers that we're used to that we can actually measure. And what we have seen is really quite strong biology. When you look at individuals where in test tubes and you look at samples, apobetalone normalizes a number of adverse profiles, which we know might be really quite common after a heart attack. And you need to test it ultimately in people. We have data from the phase two trials in about 700 people suggesting in a stable chronic disease patient population, this drug seemed to reduce events, but the effects seem to be greater among those with diabetes, with a low HDL cholesterol, and with high CRP, so inflammation. And that's the patient population that we studied. So high CRP is reflected in the post-ACS patient, and everybody had to have an acute coronary syndrome, two-thirds MI. Everybody had to have a low HDL cholesterol. Everybody had to have diabetes. The population in this study randomized 2,425 patients. Standard of care was excellent with high use of revascularization, high doses statins, beta blockers, aspirins, etc. So everything was, uh, was done appropriately in the background. Despite all of that, the, uh, the patient population that we studied was actually the, the typical for this kind of study. The average duration of diabetes was about eight years. Baseline LDL was about 70 milligrams per deciliter by protocol. HDL was low at 33 and HbA1c was around 7.3. So other risk factors well controlled. Everybody has diabetes. And we then conducted this outcome study. And what we showed is that it was powered on uh, about a 30% relative risk reduction, and we needed 250 events. We had 274 events in this trial, so we had a few more. And what we found was a uh, apobetalone had a hazard ratio of 0.82, but with an upper boundary of confidence interval of 1.04, so it was not statistically significant. The absolute difference was about 2% between apobetalone and placebo, 2% lower in favor of apobetalone. If we look at individuals where deaths of uncertain, of undetermined origin were excluded, so you had about 251 events here, the hazard ratio was 0.79, with an upper boundary of the confidence interval of 1.01, .01, p-value of 0.06. That's consistent with the primary findings, so we have to be cautious. Everything else now that the primary findings are not significant has to be considered nominal or exploratory. What we're encouraged by is that every component, with the exception of stroke, showed a favorable trend, with also a 41% statistically lower reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. But this should be considered nominal because it comes way down the hierarchy. With respect to safety, uh, the, Adverse events were similar between the two groups. Discontinuation for abnormal LFTs, liver function tests, which we had seen in previous studies, were lower than we had seen before, and the absolute difference was 2.9 versus 2%. With the exception of that, there was nothing else uh, untoward that we observed. So as investigators, we have to conclude that it did not show an, a significant benefit Given that we'd powered on 30%, if the real treatment effect is about 20%, we were therefore underpowered with the number of events to show a smaller difference in treatment effect. However, given the promising signs, 
And given this was a well-treated patient population and the unmet need, we think this holds considerable promise and perhaps a slightly larger study with a few more events would allow us to basically assess more robustly whether this drug might provide a 20% treatment effect in this patient population.